ora. Welcome to this message from Hope Chapel Hamilton. We hope that this message inspires you and we pray that it brings you encouragement wherever you are in life. Thank you, worship team. Outstanding job. Why don't we give the worship team a round of applause? Man, I, something was happening. If that word this day and at the end of worship was for you, you make sure you claim that throughout the rest of the service. If you want someone to pray for you, we'd love to do that uh, for you after the service as well. Hey, it's cool to see you. Well, I can't actually really see you because I haven't turned the house lights on yet. So I'm pretending it's cool to see your beautiful faces. It's just darkness to me. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Hey, good to see you in our 11 o'clock. Uh, I get the privilege of doing the next uh, instalment of our series. But before I get into that, I just want to give a bit of an update for you on our miracle offering because it's been a little while since we've talked about that. And uh, uh, for those who are newer, we received a miracle offering in September uh, last year and it's been, it was an awesome day. We celebrated a big carnival and stuff. So $304,000 has been pledged in our miracle offering. That's incredible. We want to thank you for that. Why don't you give yourselves a round of applause? That's you guys have done that. And of that 304000 so far to date, we've received in $238,000. So that deserves even a bigger round of applause for yourself. Pat yourselves on the back. That's outstanding. You know, the miracle offering. So... This is how it works, right? Our, our general tithes and offerings weekly goes to paying the bills and running the ministries and doing all that we're called to do as a church. But it's our miracle offering that actually advances us or extends us into all that God has for us. It enables us to, to bless other ministries and to do mission work and to, to plant churches and all of the cool stuff that God's uh, promised and believed for us to do. And so we're moving forward as a church through the miracle offering. It, it represents huge potential when we uh, see a miracle offering like that. And so far in 2018, remember the categories were build, extend and plant. So, so far in the build, we've managed to upgrade some uh, equipment that was much needed in Hamilton location. And also we've paid off a significant amount of debt this year, which is, which is exciting, right? Uh, debt reduction in church life is it's incredibly exciting for those who know what's going on. It's not so exciting for the rest of the people because you don't see any change, right? But let me tell you, it's a huge relief as pastors and leaders when we start paying down our debt. And uh, so this year so far, we've paid over $300,000 of our building off, which is outstanding, isn't it? Why, that's incredible. Praise God for that. Through our miracle offering and other donations, and it's been incredible to be able to take a huge chunk of debt off of this Hamilton location. In our extend part of it, we've, uh, made two donations to Vision Churches International. That's Nick and Karen Klinkenberg, who are planning churches in Europe. Most of us will never go and be a part of church planning in Europe. Nick's actually there right now uh, running a church planning training school, raising up young church planners to go out and plant churches in Europe. And if he was here, he'd be telling you that it's one of the greatest unreached people groups is Western Europe. And uh, to plant churches in there is an incredible thing to be doing. So we're supporting that. Monthly support to Fiji, we've been sending over support. And that goes to Savu Savu to run their ministries, but also there's a, a local hospital there and an orphanage and a school that we've been supporting people in those areas as well. And also we've put aside some money to go to the, the next phase of the Savu Savu building project as well, which is incredible. I'm having competition here, but that's all right. I've got the microphone. Okay, so so we're, we're building this next phase of the building and I'm actually there next week to meet with the guys and we're planning the next phase and at a conference as well. And it's exciting days in Fiji, let me just tell you that, and I'll be able to give you more of an update later on. In our plant category, we've been able to purchase a whole new sound system for our Cambridge congregation, and also we fitted out the new Cambridge venue as well. And for those of you who haven't been out to Cambridge yet, I encourage you to make the trip out there because it's cool. It's actually looking like Hope Chapel now. We've got our own venue and it's all set up. We've got a stage and it looks nice and great sound gear. And that, it's an awesome church happening out there in Cambridge every single Sunday at five o'clock. So that's our miracle offering. I just want to take a moment to thank you for your generous, faithful giving. And also to bring a bit of a reminder, maybe you pledged something and it's kind of gone on the back burner. You've forgotten all about what's happening. I'm bringing you right back smack in front of you again today and just saying, hey, just remember, if you pledge something, if you've been giving, uh, keep that up because it's making a huge difference. And we're putting the money to use every single week. We're sending money out and doing some incredible things. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart to all that you've been giving faithfully, generously, miraculously into the kingdom of God. Awesome stuff. All right. Is that good? It's a good update for you. Yeah. Some of you might want to go and put next part of your pledge in before you head home today. That would be fantastic. Okay, into the series, foundation series. Uh, this purpose of the series really is, 
we understand that the people are on a different journey of faith throughout the congregation. Some people have been Christians all your life and you know a whole heap of stuff. You might be realising that a lot of the stuff you've come to understand or believe might have been not quite right and you're readjusting and others are brand new to this whole Christian thing, this Jesus thing, and you're on a journey. And it'd be wrong for us to assume as leadership that we all understand the basic foundations of Christianity. And also it's a great refresher or baseline for all of us as we journey through the series. We wanted to present, uh, we've packaged it up into eight weeks and we wanted to present eight uh, weekends of foundational teaching into what it means to be a Christian. And I think this is a valuable thing for us to do and it'll be podcast and resources available to point people to as well. We're going to cover topics like salvation and the Word and baptism and Holy Spirit and communion and all those types of things. Now, Brendan Vink did a great job opening it up a couple of weeks ago. It's so cool to have Brendan and Sophie Vink as part of our Cambridge congregation. And he, his job was to talk about Jesus and salvation. And I was away, I missed it, but I listened to the podcast. Outstanding job, Brendan did. And I, I was actually in Adelaide uh, that weekend and I realised last week with all that was going on, I didn't really bring much of an update from Adelaide. And I just wanted to update you what went on. I went to a Holy Spirit conference run by David and Donna Hall in Adelaide and uh, it was an amazing conference. He had Pastor Phil Pringle, Pastor Russell Evans and Pastor Jabin Javez there from the States. And it, it was awesome. Heaps and heaps of pastors from all over the world gathered together. And it was a great time of impartation and I caught something again and I shared last Sunday that that I'm more determined than ever that where God's taking us as a church we can't strategize for it and have run slick programs and all of that stuff but we have to we it's got to be out of a move of God in the house and we have to create containers and structure and strategy to maintain all of that stuff but it has to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's what our city needs it's what our nation needs and I'm more determined than ever to chase after that and believe God for it. And then I also preached at Josh Pittman's church. If you remember, he was here back in September uh, last year in our Holy Spirit series, a young guy, friends of ours, and he just had taken on that church. And it's so cool that since September, that church has doubled in size and they've taken on another location and some awesome things are happening for, the, for them over there in Adelaide. And uh, so I, I did that. And also Josh took me up the river. They go, oh, let's go up the river for a night. And, uh, and they have a shack up right up on the Murray River, right up in the, in the kind of like the outback of Australia, really. It's just like all just scrubland and whatever and through a lock gate into this place. And I said, oh, let's get a fire going. We'll cook some marshmallows. These Aussies are crazy, by the way, because they don't use kindling for fire. They just build, pile up logs and then douse the whole thing in petrol. And then we stand back and flick matches at it and wait for it to, which one catches and it's just engulfed in flames. And we had cooked breakfast and dinner out there just hanging out in the, in the outback. It was awesome. And uh, the thing was, though, I... I had my 30th birthday out there when we used to live in Adelaide and Sarah had bought me a little pit bike, motorbike, a little wee mini one. And uh, it's a cool thing to get for your 30th birthday, trying to keep me young, I suppose. And, and so we were riding around on that and I was, one day we were going to go fishing down by the river and I jumped on just in my jandals. Australians call them the thongs, which I still can't quite get my head around. But anyway, I just wanted to say that on Sunday morning church. But, but, but anyway, I'm running out of time. So, so I get on this pit bike, took, took off down the thing and, and they forgot to tell me about wombat holes, okay? So, by the way, just a point of pastoral advice, everything in Australia wants to kill you, okay? That's just how it works, the spiders and the snakes and everything else. We were collecting firewood and Josh was looking under the firewood and I was like, what? what's he doing? And I was like, oh, that's right, we've got to look out for snakes. And I said to him something about snakes. He said, oh, don't worry about those too much. They go underground this time of year. And I said, well, what are you looking for? He said, spiders, man. You don't want to touch those spiders. And I was like, oh, far out. But they didn't tell me about the wombats this time when I, on my 30th. And I took off and these wombat holes are huge, right? And they, they dig these big holes in the ground and then they leave them. And I, I literally rode my pit bike inside a wombat hole in my jandals and my thongs and bodies and a singlet. It was not a pretty sight at all. And uh, I was pretty badly injured, cut up and stuff. And then so when they heard I was going out to the outback, Sarah rang me up and said, just watch out for wombat holes. And then every single person that I heard we were going up to the river for a night kept saying, watch out for those wombat holes with this cheeky grin. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we got on the motorbikes and we're tearing around this place. And little did I know there's a wombat hole right on the corner of the track. And I, I made it one lap around. The next lap I washed out straight into this wombat hole again, crashed on the thing. This time, luckily, I had boots and a helmet on and stuff, but I... Smashed my ribs up. I reckon that I've broken something or something, but uh, they just told me to get hard and, and whatever. <laughs> Those Aussies. But anyway, so that's what I was doing. Uh, Brennan Vink was preaching a, 
a Holy Spirit inspired message and I was lying on the side of a wombat hole nursing my ribs. But anyway, Brendan spoke on Jesus and salvation. So Jesus, he's the cornerstone of everything that we believe, right, in church. And he's not just a good man or a prophet. He's actually the son of God. And he died and rose to life to pay a price for our sins so that we have relationship with God for eternity. And it's a free gift to anyone who just asks for forgiveness to receive Jesus into their lives. It's awesome. Brendan did a great job. And last week, it was a long weekend. So I pushed pause on our series and we had a Holy Spirit uh, ministry Sunday here in church. If you guys were away on holiday or whatever, well, good on you, but you missed out on a great day because we, the power of God moved and people were touched and healed and uh, people were falling down under the power of God and we we're praying for a whole altar full of people to receive the Holy Spirit. It was an outstanding, amazing morning of ministry. And for those of you we kind of took some time to explain what was going on. But for those of you who have questions from what took place last Sunday and trying to understand what it's all about and why people fall down and what's the Holy Spirit, those are great questions. And we're going to cover them next Sunday. Uh, Neil Fletch is going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit and baptism. And we're going to learn all about what that's about as well. But this week, we have a topic that I'm going to be speaking about, which is huge value for us as a church. And it's something that I don't actually get to speak on very much as a sermon topic, and that's communion. Communion. Now, communion is actually a sacrament or an ordinance of our Christian faith. Those are big, fancy words that we may not understand, but really, essentially, they just mean that it's something incredibly important, and it's a requirement of us as believers. Now, we usually take communion here at Hope Chapel every month or so. We, we don't do it religiously every month, but we aim to have communion around about once a month where we take some time in our service to focus around the cross and Jesus and the elements of communion and we take it together as a church. And a few weeks ago, uh, we had Josh Fredericks come up here, a young guy in our church in the youth ministry that Stuart leads, and he came up and led us in communion. And I heard he did an absolutely outstanding job. I don't know if Josh is here today. I can't see him, but he did a fantastic job leading us in communion. And uh, I heard from so many people what an amazing preacher he is, the gift of God on his life as a communicator. I'm just so encouraged to see young guys coming up through our youth ministry who are gifted communicators, have the call of God on their lives. And we actually have a whole lot more people lined up throughout the rest of 2018 to lead us in communion throughout the times every month or so. And uh, I'm excited by it because it's, it just gives people an opportunity, but also we get to hear different voices around communion. But because of that, I, it's not something I often get to speak to as pastor. And, and I, I'm looking forward today to actually focus a whole message around this thing called communion, something we value hugely. Now, you know, there's actually two things that the Bible says that we must do as Christians. Two things as Christ followers that we must do. The first one is communion, and the second one is water baptism. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot of things that we should do, uh, personal disciplines like reading the Word and prayer and worship and gathering together as believers, all of that kind of stuff. But there's only two things that Jesus left us as a command for us to do as Christ followers, and that's communion and water baptism. And we're going to be covering water baptism as part of this foundation series in a couple of weeks' time. And then we're going to be baptising people as well. And these are always awesome services. And I, let me just say, I don't want to cover it too much now, but let me just say that if you're sitting here this morning and you have not been water baptised, then service in two weeks' time is for you. You need to be baptised. The Bible, there was no unbaptised believers in the Bible. They got, they got saved and they were baptised straight away. And so it's incredibly important for us to take the plunge and be baptised. So we're going to be doing that uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So we take communion every month or so together as a church and we put this focus on it. Now, some churches do it more often than once a month. Maybe they do it every week or every fortnight. Other churches do it even less often than once a month. And it may be that we change that up in a little while. We may not always do it once a month, but it's the way we're doing it right now. It's how we're rolling and it seems to be working pretty good for us. You might say, well, I, I like communion every single week. That's great. You take communion every single week. You do it at your homes and with your family and around meals or even better, do it as part of your hope groups. Take communion together and celebrate what Jesus has done. Communion was designed to do in all different ways and places and styles, not just Sunday morning worship service. Should be done in a whole lot of different ways. Now, did you know 
This is an interesting piece of information for you. Did you know that communion, the word communion, was not actually in the Bible at all? Does someone open that for me, please. It's not even in the Bible at all. Paul actually refers to communion as the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, this is a really interesting passage of Scripture, actually. We'll come back to it in a moment. But communion, the word communion means a shared or mutual participation and it comes from the word community, community. I hope we're learning something. It's a little bit more teachy, this series, but I, I pray that we get a really great foundation about the sacrament called communion. It's interesting that the whole meaning of this word, communion, is about relationship with each other. And you might be sitting there saying, hang on a minute, I thought communion is about remembering Jesus. Uh, yeah, you're right, it is. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But it also, it's sometimes called this word called Eucharist. You might have heard that before, which comes from a Greek word meaning to give thanks, to give thanks. And Jesus gave thanks and he broke the bread. Communion is actually very much about two relationships, relationship with God and relationship with each other. And you may have heard me talk in another message about a vertical shaft of relationship between us and heaven or God, and also a horizontal shaft of relationship between each other as believers and being Christ to humanity. This is incredibly important because often in Christian circles, we get this vertical shaft right, and yet we neglect to have relationship with one another. It's almost like we should be worshipping God with our hands up in one direction and the other hand outwards, ministering to other people and being, bringing Christ to them in their world and sharing experiences with each other. And communion was designed to be exactly that way, arms up and arms out. The sacrament of communion is there to help us remember what Christ did on the cross for us. But it's also designed to be done in community, in unity, in relationship, building relationships with one another. Now, communion has its roots in Exodus chapter 12. And we, you may not know what's in Exodus chapter 12, but you know that the Passover story, right? This is where, where the God sends a plague and, and all the firstborn are gonna be completely wiped out. They're gonna be killed. But what God says is put blood on the mantelpiece above the door and they will be saved. And it's gonna be a way to bring them out of slavery into freedom. And so they do that and it works. And, and it's interesting what God says, right? That it works when God says it. And so, and so they did this and God sent this plague to kill them all. And all of those who had the blood on their doorpost were saved. Their lives were spared by a sacrifice of blood. And it's this Passover celebration that communion is actually formed. So from this, from this day where God saved them, they, every year they would remember Passover and have a Passover meal where they remember what God did for them down through the generations. And communion was found in this moment. And it's actually in all the Gospels. I want to look at Luke chapter 22 here this morning. When the time came, Jesus and His apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. I'm just going to have another drink because I'm starting to spit all over my iPad, which is not good, right? I know it's not out of excitement because I'm just reading this word here. I've been eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled by the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this is the new, cup, the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice to you. So here they were sharing this Passover meal, remembering what God had done generations before for their ancestors. And Jesus takes this moment of remembering, sharing the Passover meal together. And Jesus takes this foundation and builds a whole new tradition of communion on it. I love it how Jesus did that. His blood will be spilt to take the sin of the world. Just like the Israelites were redeemed from slavery by blood, the blood of the lamb redeems us from sin and death. So Jesus takes an old tradition and adds a new significance to it and says, from now on, do this in remembrance of me. It's powerful. In John 1, 29, John the Baptist declares, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ is referred to as the Passover lamb. That's the lamb that they use to celebrate the Passover meal 
every single year for generations and generations. Jesus is clearly saying in the Gospels to do this now to remember Him. Now, there's a number of views on communion and what exactly it is or how we should take it and what's the rules or regulations or religious things around it. I just want to tell you at Hope Chapel, we don't really have a whole lot of rules around communion, okay? You don't have to be saved a certain amount of time to do it. We do it with juice, uh, although I was thinking maybe shot glasses might be quite cool. We can just have a little shot to remember Jesus. I don't know. We don't have a whole lot of rules. You don't have to be a certain age to do it. You don't have to repeat a special prayer or do something like that. Uh, But really, if you wanted to put us in a category of all the different views of communion, I would say that at Hope Chapel here, we have a memorial view of communion. That really just means that we do it as a way of remembering what Jesus has done. We don't believe that the emblems are holy or that once the pastor or elder or priest or someone prays over the juice or wine and the bread that it becomes a holy element or that we have to treat it in a special way. It's just bread and it's just juice or wine if you go to one of those churches or or crackers or gluten-free something if you roll that way. Whatever it is, it's just food and drink. And, And we just take that as a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, His blood and His body. We also, by the way, don't believe that that it turns into actually Jesus' body and actually Jesus' blood. We're, we're not into eating people's bodies and blood, drinking blood here at church. I know some churches or traditions do believe that it turns into Jesus' body, spiritually or practically or whatever other way. We don't believe that. It's just bread that we're eating, okay? It's just juice, but it's a holy moment when the Spirit of God comes on it and we begin to remember what Jesus has done for us. So you can use anything at all. You, you, when I was a youth pastor years ago, we used to do it with Coke and hot chips. It worked really well. It was a way to get the kids to take communion because they love Coke and they love hot chips. And it's a great time to hang out and eat food and remember Jesus. Uh, you can do it in your home. You can eat, do it around a roast meal or whatever you want to do. You don't have to have a roast meal out and then say, oh, let's do communion together and cut up little tiny bits of bread because that's how we do it in church and leave the roast sitting there and take little bits of bread to remember Jesus. No, you can do it with your roast meal. You can remember Him as, oh, roast chicken. Uh, Anyway, everyone just wants to get out of here now, right? You can do it in any way. That's all I'm trying to say. The elements don't matter, but what they represent matters. And I think too often we focus too much on the elements and forget about what... They represent. So our relationship with God or this vertical shaft of remembrance. We have a tradition or a time where we put all things aside and we focus and remember what Jesus has purchased for us. The life that we have, the hope that we carry in our hearts because of Him. So there's also this horizontal shaft of relationship operating during communion. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this, When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread... Aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we will all eat from one loaf, showing that we are one body. Thinking about the people of Israel, weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? Communion is supposed to be shared with one another. In those times, it was actually a big shared meal. They didn't get the little cut up piece of bread and sip of juice. They had whole big meals together and fellowship. Lots and lots and lots of food and lots and lots and lots of wine to drink. It was a big feast. It sounds pretty cool to me, actually. I'd love to do that and just clear all the things out and have a big feast together as a church. Sounds pretty cool. But it did actually present some problems uh, in this time because the, the rich people, everyone had to bring their own food. And so those who were really wealthy started showing off and they'd bring all their fineries and all their big food, more than they could eat and drink. And then the poor people were left with nothing and that wasn't shared among each other. And they started using it as like a hierarchy thing and it became problematic. It turns out they weren't too good at sharing back in the early church as well. My kids need to learn a little bit about that. Anyway, they had this big, massive feast. Now remember this passage that I mentioned earlier where Paul refers to communion as the Lord's Supper. I said we'd come back to it. This is why when I come back to it, they were actually being told off by Paul in this chapter. It's really interesting, actually. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20 says this. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. There's that reference. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry and others get drunk. Crazy. This is verse 22. What? That's what it actually says. I'm not just saying that. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? 
What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. I love it how Paul just cuts to the chase and nails them on it. Communion was designed to be about relationship and unity as a body. All believers meeting together and sharing in fellowship, remembering what Jesus had done for them. So nowadays we, we do it individually, really. We line up in these pews and we have a little sip of juice and a little square of bread or a cracker or whatever. And maybe it's nice and orderly and maybe it means we can fit it into our service times and it's nice and neat and tidy. But I think we're missing out hugely on a whole side of what communion was actually designed for, relationship and communion with each other. We get very good at this. Remember John Fincaldi a couple of weeks ago talked about rows and circles. I think this applies to communion as well. We're good at doing it in rows, looking at the front, listening to music or a pastor praying a scripture or something and having this little vertical moment with God, but we forget about the person sitting beside us and around us and in front of us who are doing life as well and could be encouraged by your story. The vertical and the horizontal, it's both in communion. It was designed for both. And all over this building, there are similar stories that go something like this. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was bound up, but now I'm free. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was a sinner. I'm still a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. Jesus is the common thread in all of our stories. No matter what background you have, no matter what family you come from, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter what race you are, how hard your life has been, when Jesus enters our story, it brings a unity to all of us because we all understand the grace and the power and the life of Jesus Christ because He died for us and raised to life with us. For us, we have a hope and a purpose and a destiny and a future and we can have life here and now. That's the power of communion. We've got to be sharing it with each other. So when the tradition of communion was first started, it was a point of common ground of, of unity amongst the believers. Kind of sounds like our Corridor Speak series, right, that we've just done, where we swap stories and realise that our backgrounds might be different, but Jesus is at the centre of everything. It's the same here today for all of us. The person next to you and around you has experienced Jesus in a similar way than you have. His name is Jesus. That's the common ground. He loves you so much that He died for you. That's communion, church. In Acts 2, 42, it says this, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. So here we're clearly told that we're to devote ourselves to the celebration or sacrament of the Lord's Supper or communion. It's listed alongside things as teaching or fellowship, gathering as a church, and to prayer. It's got to be pretty important, right, if it's listed in there with those things. It's the clearest symbolic representation we have of our redemption through Christ. His body that was broken for us. His blood that was shed for us so that we might have life. So today we're actually going to take communion together in relationship with each other and in remembrance of Him. Just as the band's getting organised, let me just say this to you, church. We are never, as a church, begin to become too modern or too New Day church that we forget about the blood of Jesus and the cross of Jesus. And that we move past communion as though we've somehow graduated from that. We can never move past the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the power of everything that we believe here as a church. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead is here and now with us. Jesus conquered sin and death for you. This power, <coughs> excuse me, this power in that. The cross of Jesus is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. And we must take moments out of our busy lives, like we are right now, to pause and to reflect and to remember the cross of Jesus. The hope that we have in our hearts that life that you're experiencing right now, the presence of God that we can feel, it all comes down to the cross of Jesus, that He was willing to die for us. And did you know that when we pause to remember Jesus and the price He's paid for us and we take time to share with others, it creates a moment of power for God to move. See, the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus can be released in people's lives as we take the emblems and remember Him. You know that communion does not have to be 
a religious practice. It does not have to be boring. Communion does not have to be something weird that we have to kind of endure when we come to church. Communion is not some old school thing that some churches decide to keep doing. There is power in this moment, not because of the emblems, but there's power in this moment because it represents the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's power in this moment because it represents the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from our sin. There's power in this moment because it represents the broken body of Jesus that was broken and beaten for us so that we might experience life and healing and deliverance. Did you know that healing can literally happen for us as we're taking communion? Breakthrough can happen in our world as we take communion. Freedom can come into people's lives. Addictions can be broken, hurt, depression, anxiety. Some of those things can just drop off supernaturally as we take communion. Not because of the little piece of bread or the little sip of juice. It's because of the life of Jesus Christ that is being honoured and represented in this moment. We remember the act that purchased these things for us. Salvation is ours through the cross and it's remembered through communion. Most importantly this morning, communion brings life. We may be remembering a death, but it brings life to us. It was prophesied like this in Isaiah 53. Still, it's what God had in mind all along to crush Him with pain. The plan was that He would give Himself as an offering for sin so that He'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. So let's take communion as a church family today, but let's do it a little bit differently this morning. Let's take it with power. Let's take it with life. Let's take it in a fun way, in fellowship this morning. Now, sometimes communion needs to be done in a sombre or sober way. Sometimes we need to reflect and remember the pain and suffering that Jesus did for us that He went through for us. Sometimes we need to quiet our spirit and remember in this sad kind of atmosphere. That's all good, but it does not have to be always done that way. We can celebrate communion and victory and celebration and fun and life and energy, remembering that we actually have a life and a future because of Jesus and all He's done. So today we're gonna take it from a place of declaration. We're gonna take it from a place of faith, of celebration and of victory. Jesus, we thank You for the life that we have, for the promise of eternal life with God, for the healing that we're yet to see. We thank You in faith as we take communion. For the breakthrough that we're believing for, we thank You in faith for the power, for the freedom, for all the good things that You promised us as part of the Kingdom of Heaven. Jesus, we thank You for those things this morning as we take these emblems together as a church. Praise God, praise You, Jesus. We thank You that You are alive and that You have the victory and that Your Name is great and marvellous and wonderful and higher than anything else in our life. Jesus, we thank You for the honour that it is to serve You and walk with You in humility. Jesus, it's always all about You. And this morning, in this atmosphere of faith, Lord, we come to the altar and we thank You for dying for us, for taking the sin of the world on Your shoulders so that we could have life, 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 and more life. So this is what we're going to do, church. Take your emblems and let's stand to our feet for a moment. I hope that as we've been talking about communion, it's also reminded you of the victory that you have and the hope that you carry in your hearts. This is what I'd love for us to do, is that I'd love you to find somebody to take communion with today. Not in silence and not somberly, but take communion And just take a moment to say what, thank Jesus what He's done in your world. Just tell the gratefulness of heart, the thankfulness of spirit and say, 
Oh, Jesus entered my world and He saved me from this and this and this and I've got a bright future because of Him. Something like that. Now you can do it with the person next to you. If you're extra super brave and daring, you might even turn around and look at someone behind you. Or maybe you'd cross the aisle and do it with somebody across the aisle or something like that. But let's do it in fun, in fellowship, horizontal connection and relationship and communion. The worship team's just gonna sing tremble while we do that. So you can make as much noise as you want to, take as long as you want to take communion and celebration together this morning. I've got three minutes, 53 seconds to go. <laughs> so let's stand to our feet and uh, this is what I wanna do, right? We celebrated communion in a fun fellowship way, talking about the victory that we have. But I understand that when we talk about some of this stuff, there's people in church at any given moment that are struggling in life. And maybe you need a miracle in your body and there's an impossible situation you're facing. It's in these moments celebrating communion that we can remember that Jesus is more powerful than that sickness that you're facing. And maybe you've got a broken relationship or maybe there's something hard going on in your world and you're trying to figure out the way forward and we're taking communion and it brings perspective again of the greatness and majesty of Jesus to restore relationships. And Or maybe you're struggling with anxiety and depression and maybe there's a mental struggle in your mind right now. Do you know that that thing has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus? And Jesus has been lifted up here this morning. All morning, we've been lifting the name of Jesus. There's an atmosphere of faith here and you don't have to leave facing that battle again. You can deal with it now and Jesus can come through and heal you and set you free. Maybe you're facing an addiction and it just keeps coming back over and over again and you just can't seem to see a way forward. Let me tell you, the power of the name of Jesus can smash that thing right here in this moment. Supernatural miracle can take place in your world. Maybe you're facing financial pressure and it's just doing your head in and it's so hard. Let me tell you again, the name of Jesus is greater than anything else. Maybe you're, you're, you're dealing with some things where you're thinking that you're not good enough or you're unworthy or life doesn't measure up. Doesn't matter if any of that stuff doesn't matter because the grace of Jesus is here for you regardless of what you've done, what your past is, and you can be saved and set free in a moment. So in this place of faith and this atmosphere, we're gonna close the service by praying. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you've come here with, but Jesus knows. And the only thing that I need to know in this moment is that the Name of Jesus is greater than what you're facing. And it may not feel like it for you right now, but I can stand in faith and declare that His Name is greater than that condition. His Name is greater than that situation. His Name is greater than that battle that you're facing. And we're gonna pray very simply in faith that the Name of Jesus would be lifted above your situation. And we're gonna believe for miracles to take place and that you're gonna be set free in this moment of communion. Are you with me, church? We're gonna all pray together. Come on, let's take authority over this stuff in the Name of Jesus. God, we thank You for the power of the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank You that Your Name is greater than any condition, that Your Name is greater than anxiety and depression and mental illness. So we take authority over those things in the Name of Jesus. We break their power and we declare the greatness and majesty and wonderful Name of Jesus over those situations. Lord, we speak to every physical illness that is in this building right now. We speak healing power of the blood of Jesus over that situation. We lift the Name of Jesus up and declare that His Name, by His strength, we are healed and so we speak healing in the Name of Jesus. Lord, break their power of that condition in the Name of Jesus. Lord, we speak restoration of relationships. We speak restoration of life. Lord, we stand against anything that would come against the body of Christ and we say, the enemy, you have no right, you have no power, you have no authority when compared to the Name of Jesus. And we thank You that everything will bow its knee to the Name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace and we declare the Name of Jesus over every situation, over every circumstance. And we stand up on the inside in faith and we speak to that thing, to that mountain, to that blockage, to that addiction, to whatever it is. And we declare the Name of Jesus, Lord, that the cross is still powerful, that the body of Jesus that was broken for us, that the blood of Jesus that was spilt for us, we access that right, that power, that authority now. And we lift the Name of Jesus above, above, above. And we declare that healing would come in the Name of Jesus. Come on church, let's lift His Name. One more moment, let's lift His Name. Jesus, You're worthy, You're worthy, You're worthy, You're worthy of all praise, all honour, all glory, all majesty.
mercy. Lord, it's always all about You and we lift You up to Your rightful place here this morning. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Well, God bless you, church. I pray that you've learned something about communion today and that we can go from this place taking communion regularly in all different contexts, remembering the power of the blood of Jesus in our world. Go and have an outstanding day. Be blessed. Very blessing over you and your family and your household this week in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us for this message. For more information about our church, head along to www.hopechapel.nz. See you next time.